goal of this podcast is to help you break in and thrive in advertising. And today we're going to talk about culture, a topic marketers are always discussing. Strategists are asked for cultural insights. Creatives are asked to disrupt cultures with mind-blowing activations, but it often gets forgotten by the time a campaign makes its way into the world. Marcus Collins and I break down culture today, and its vitality to successful work, and his new book, For the Culture, where it goes into far greater depth. It's an incredible read that brings immediate value to any marketing or advertising work you're up to right now, and will serve as a lifeline back to the piece that matters most. People. If there's one thing you can never forget as a marketer and advertiser, it's that it's always about people and the cultures they create. So break it down with me and Marcus today. I'm Cooper Kolvig, and I'll be your host this week. Kick it, Mikey. All right, Marcus, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the, the Breaking and Entering show, and thank you so much for taking the time. Yo, thanks for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. Right on. So for every one of my episodes, we always start with my guests breaking and entering story. So how did you find the advertising and marketing world? Why did you decide to get into it? And what's gotten you to where you are now? I, uh, I found it serendipitously happenstance without knowing. I think I didn't realize that advertising was an actual career trajectory until probably the Mad Men episode. I mean, it's interesting that the cultural production of the time is what led me into uh, the space, not the ads itself. As I never really thought of that you can make a living making ads. It just didn't, it didn't seem to compute for me for some reason. It just didn't seem like that was a, a, a thing. Um, my first understanding of advertising um, was probably the movie Boomerang, Eddie Murphy, Boomerang. It's the first time I saw uh, a black ad, ad exec and even then, I didn't know what that meant. Um, but that was my introduction to what it is. And my first pure foray into it uh, was being an account director at a pure play social media agency named Big Fuel. How did you find Big Fuel and what kind of drew you to it as something that you thought you'd want to dip your toes into? At the time, I was running digital strategy for Beyonce, and I met the founder of Big Fuel, uh, a gentleman by the name of Avi Savar, uh, through, a, through a family friend. who he, he, was, he was a family friend through my now wife. Um, and I was just kind of taken by his ambition, his point of view on the world. It just, I, just, you know, I, I, just, I, I really gravitated to him. And when I was looking for an agency to build Beyonce's uh, website uh, and sort of the, the plumbing for her social presence, I was like, oh man, I should tap into Abby. I mean, he, he was one of a few people that I reached out to, but I knew Abby would have a good, a good take on it. And then we did. And actually we awarded uh, Abby the business. So when I was thinking about leaving the world of music, considering you know, where do you go after you work for Beyonce? Honestly, you know, everything just felt like kind of a step down in a lot of ways. Um, I was thinking like, you know, where would I go next? What would I do? I was like, well, maybe advertising. And I thought, well, who knows? Who do I know who knows advertising best? And that was Avi. So I was sort of telling him, bemoaning, if you will, about what I was doing, what I wanted to do, and you know, kind of where I was feeling uh, stuck. And he's like, why don't you come work with us? I said, Dude, I never even thought about that. He was like, yeah, yo, we can totally use your experience. And, I, and he, he had a, you know, I credit him because he saw the transferable skills before I did, you know, before I realized what the transferable skills were at the time, he saw them in me and he gave me an opportunity that on the, on, on paper, I wasn't really built for or ready for, but he saw it and he invested in me. Right on. So. Before advertising, though, I know the, the music world was, was your first calling. What were you doing there? And how did that curate some of those transferable skills that you're talking about? So my first introduction to music, I was writing and producing. I was a songwriter. Um, not a very successful one, but a songwriter nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, I, I went to be babyface as badly as 
as possible. You know, I just really wanted to be baby face. Uh, and that didn't happen for me. Uh, but I was still very much curious about the music industry and how to be successful in it. So I decided to go on the business side. I went to business school uh, at the Ross School of Business University of Michigan to really understand this disruption that we're calling digital and what it meant for the industry, what it meant for the space. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a marketer, but in the back of my mind, I really just kind of, you know, get my, my demo hurt. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> I was like, my story is going to be, I went to business school to be a marketer. And while I was in there, someone heard my demo. I was like, yo, you're the guy. I'm like, yeah, I'm the guy. And then I, you know, that was the story of telling myself that didn't pan out that way clearly, but that's what I was hoping for myself. Uh, and so the, the, my creativity was manifested through marketing communications. And, uh, that's really where I spent, let's say the, the, the better years of the music industry where I feel like I had the most success. And I figured like that, that was a, that was a cool thing for me and the transferable skills into advertising was one, I was a marketer to a, a start, but on the ad side, you know, it's really about finding connections where things, where connections don't exist, like find those disparate uh, connections between those connections between disparate things. And I felt as a musician, that's what I did. You know, I take a sample here and a chord change there and a, a rhythm there. And I take all these things that seemed to have nothing to do with each other, seemed to be completely disparate on the surface. And I find the connective tissue to make something anew. I think advertising at its best, the creative part of advertising, we're at our best is the ability to connect the dots in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And you've had a ton of success in, in the advertising world, um, so much so that even now pairing with uh, your experience within academia, you have a new book out for the culture. That's right. Um, pretty exciting. And you, you even were the strategy director at one of the world's most renowned advertising agencies, uh, Wyden and Kennedy. Across all of that time, though, and you, you used um, a word earlier when you were talking about digital um, and we're talking about marketing and advertising and how, as I have found my time within this world, that we don't have consistent language across agencies, across schools, uh, across countries, across the globe. And it's pretty hard to decipher. And the core of, of your book is, is about culture. So... Let's start there. And what, is, what does culture mean uh, to you and the world? And, yeah. and how can we use it to fuel better marketing and advertising? Well, every agency I've worked with and for, we've always talked about culture. When we get our ideas out in the culture, our ideas need to be informed by culture. We need to understand what's happening in culture. We have a good culture here. Culture, 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 culture. Whether it was that big fuel, Translation, where I ran, uh, I built and ran the social practice, a donor where I created an agency inside an agency, and most recently, the head of strategy, chief strategy officer at Wyden Kennedy in New York. We all talked about culture, but there wasn't a lot of concreteness around how we talked about it, nor was there consistency in the way we talked about it. And if you don't have consistent language, then it's hard, very, very hard to operationalize it. So I look at culture through a Durkheimian lens. Emil Durkheim, one of the founding fathers of sociology, he talks about culture as being a system of conventions and expectations that demarcate who we are and what people like us do, right? It demarcates who we are and what's expected, acceptable behavior for people like us. And later still about, maybe a century later, just shy of a century later, a uh, gentleman by the name of Raymond Williams, cultural scholar, um, he put a finer point on this idea of culture and said that it's really a realized meaning making system, right? It's the way by which we make meaning of the world. So culture is a realized meaning making system of conventions and expectations that demarcate who we are, what people like us do. It's anchored in our identity, who we are. Because of who we are, we see the world a certain way, a set of beliefs, ideologies that we hold, and because we see the world a certain way, we therefore show up in the world a certain way. The artifacts we don, the behaviors we take on, the language that we use. And lastly, but certainly not least, we then express our cultural subscription through shared work or cultural product. 
literature, art, music, film, movies, television, and brands and branded products. There's become ways by which we signal to the world who we are. And because of who we are, we show up in the world the way we do and we consume the way we do as a way of making our culture material. It's very, yeah, super impressive. And appreciate you breaking it down in a way that's, that's so clear. A lot of times I feel like that's, that's a question where it's, it's hard for, for folks to get to the, the very core of it. How can you split or, you know, segment culture and in ways that and maybe you're like born into versus mm -hmm. um, what I want to say about myself. Yeah. So those are cultures to which I, my identity is ascribed versus cultures where my identity is subscribed. So when our identities are ascribed, you don't have any volition, right? Like I am Marcus Collins because I was born to Herschel and, and Jeanette Collins in the Collins family. Right. I didn't have a choice in the matter, right? My identity was ascribed. However, I chose where I wanted to go to school. I chose what fraternity I wanted to join. I chose what companies I wanted to work for. I chose which friends I wanted to have. These are all communities. These are all uh, uh, social relationships to which I have subscribed my identity. Therefore, I have volition. I have agency. I have control. And the powerful part about subscription is that we decide who we want to be. We decide who we want to be cool with. We decide uh, who we want our identity associated with or with whom we want our identity associated. And as a result, those, uh, those communities, those relationships, they are very, very powerful. They're extremely meaningful uh, because they are signifiers of who we actually are, which is, I think, uh, for a marketer, for an advertiser, for anyone with a vested interest in getting people to move, I mean, that, I don't think it gets any better than that. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine you'd have, like, culture is a pretty um, fluid concept within the, the world that you're describing where um, obviously the decisions that you're making based on who you are and how you want to be um, are going to change from time to time and, and are not a, a stationary. You're, you're stuck within that role, I presume, that's right. right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's fluid that way. Because I have volition, because I have agency, I say, okay, you know, um, I believe this thing and I'm joining this religion because I feel like there is congruence between what they believe and who I am. But then when my beliefs change or my understanding of their beliefs are no longer aligned, I go, oh, wait a minute, this isn't for me. And then what do we do? We leave and we go find something else. You know, uh, if our friends from college, we seem to outgrow them as, as some do, we go, oh man, these aren't my people anymore. And you go find other people. And we're constantly looking for community because we are, as Errol Tato says, social animals by nature. So we're constantly looking for our people. And as we evolve, because right, we're constantly growing, moving forward, as we evolve, the hope, the prayer is that we evolve with our people, that our people grow with us um, or else we grow apart. And then we say, oh man, these people are no longer expressions of who I am. And it's not like my family, what, what are you going to do? You don't choose your family. So you go, all right, you know, I'm going to go to Thanksgiving and just, man, I'm just trying to muscle my way through this. <laughs> you know, if that's the situation with your family, you go, I, I, man, this is going to be brutal. So I'm going to muscle my way through this thing. Um, we're not going to talk about religion. We're not going to talk about politics. We're not going to talk about money. Because things reveal ideology. And once ideologies are revealed, we go, oh, man, Uncle John is a racist. <laughs> or, you know, we go, oh, man, like my parents got some really jacked up views about the world relative to my views. And then we find ourselves out of sync with our people. And that becomes very, very difficult. Uh, so the notion that we can choose uh creates great power with the people that we actually select. Uh, whereas things that are, are ascribed, we are finding, we continue to find strategies to make the connections work so that we can, uh, we can get around cognitive dissonance um, that make, may, may seem, in, may, that may make those incongruences feel very, very painful. Yeah, absolutely. So if I'm, 
an, an entry level marketer. I'm at my first shop where I'm trying to get into one, um, or even I'm looking at advertising, branding, any of the different segments within our crazy world of marketing. And I'm hearing the term culture thrown out left and right, or yeah. maybe even like the cultural trend. And how do, how do we <laughs> jump on that? Yeah. How, how can I be, um, more valuable and a more valuable cultural student? Yeah. So having an understanding of culture, uh, is the first part. So that when someone says we need to get our idea on the culture or let's jump on a cultural trend, you can say to yourself, okay. So what that person means to say is, how do we participate um, in some convention that is, a, that is associated with this group of people? So let's first identify who they are, what are their beliefs, ideologies that are informing this trend that we see manifested, right? This outward expression of an inward belief. And then we say, okay, what is the trend? Is it artifact in nature? Is it behavioral in nature? Is it language in nature? Or is it the creation of some production? Then we go, okay, so now we know that this, these are the elements, the, the, the elements that make up the systems that make up the systems of culture. So we go, all right, so now, well, what do we want to contribute to? Do we want to create new artifacts? Do we want to engage in the artifacts and the discourse around the artifacts? Do we want to contribute to the behavior by perpetuating, mimicking the behavior? Or do we want to contribute to the language? by mimicry, by contribution, uh, hopefully not by this following, right? And then production, right? So as a, as a, a newly minted marketer, right? So an entry-level marketer, you come in and say, okay, what are we talking about here? Like, let's take, let's remove the abstraction of getting our idea out there and go, okay, cool. What are we talking about? And what do we want the idea to do? And if you're, when your boss hear you say that, you go, he goes, or she goes, oh, okay. Like, all right, never thought about it that way. I think it's just that kind of framing changes. Uh, it completely changes this abstract nature of, of culture and empowers us as practitioners to better understand it, analyze it, and do something about it, right? So we know what it is. Then we go, okay, so what? So what are we going to, so why does that matter? And we go, so what now? What are we going to do? Yeah, uh, that's a great way to break it down. One way that um, we talk about that kind of concept um, at my shop is what do we see? What do we think it means? And what are we going to do about it? And yeah. particularly in a way that's, that's meaningful. And it's so perfect. That, that what you just said is perfect. I talk about this in the book because I teach this in my classes. I go, what do you see? Just be descriptive. Don't add any value to it. What do you see? And then you say, well, what do you think? Now you are being, uh, you're evaluating through your cultural lens. And then you're saying to yourself, so what does it mean? Right. And, and, and I'm sure you experienced this going through that exercise that when you do that, when you slow down for just a moment, you go, oh, oh, it begins to reveal itself a bit more than just jumping on a bandwagon or, or, or just kind of being a part of what's going on in culture. I'd say with big air quotes, eye rolls, uh, and, and, and the like, it's, uh, but when we stop to think about what we see, what it means, and then what it means for us, it creates a richer tapestry for us to create, to, 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 to make meaning and create things that are potentially meaningful for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've found, and even as you're, you're talking about that, it got me thinking about what that, that exercise has done even for me on, on a smaller scale. And for anyone that's listened or listened or read, uh, any of Daniel Kahneman's work, and I know you, uh, reference it in, in your book as well, that it's a good practice to get me to shift gears mentally from system one kind of passive thinking to system two to where now we're thinking critically and we can be more, more meaningful with that's the, right. We're kind of says, slow down. You're thinking too fast. You got to slow down. You're thinking too fast. And that fast thinking that, uh, that, uh, shortcut system one thinking 
it's autopilot. It's all based on biases. It's all based on heuristics. It's all based on the way that we see the world. But the truth of the matter is that the way we see the world is not necessarily how the world is. Or Nyasian puts it this way, things aren't the way they are. Things aren't the way they see, as we see it. We see things as we are, right? Things aren't the way they are. They are the way that we are. And the better we understand that, the more likely we are to acknowledge our, our, our biases, but also take off our lenses and see the world through the meaning-making frames that other people, uh, that other people use to navigate the world. And that is empathy. Yeah, to truly be able to get, get outside of yourself and the world that, that you've understood it and, and get right. yourself into others. And there are some brands, and you reference a lot of them in your book, that do a really great job of this. And I'm sure there are plenty of others that we could reference that aren't. What's, what's keeping uh, the industry or, or folks in the industry from, from being able to, to make that switch and get out of their own skin and, and think? Because it's easy to say, and, and you hear it uh, thrown around all the time, but thinking from the, the consumer's mindset or get, putting your feet in the shoes of the consumers, but truly do it and, and then lead in org- like your organization in a, in a market-oriented way rather than the various other orientations. It takes work. You know, I mean, reference Kahneman, you know, it, we go to path of least resistance, not only physically, but also cognitively. And man, seeing the world through someone else's eyes takes a ton of work, man. And people go, I don't want to do all that. It's much easier for me to, you know, say, what does the data tell me? Or actually, what does the data say? It's our job to interpret the data, right? Data doesn't have an opinion. You do. So you look at the data and you say, okay, here's what I see. Here's what I think it means. Here's what it means for for us. But man, that requires a lot of work, lots of work, you know? Um, And therefore, we tend to go to path of resistance. but we know these things intuitively. This isn't, uh, none, of, none of this is, is sort of revelatory ideas. We know these things. We know to treat humans like humans. Yet when we enter into uh, an office setting, we put on our marketer hat and take off our human hat, right? And once we do that, we're toast, right? It's the marketers who understand people the best are the ones who win. Because our job as marketers are to get people to move, right? Uh, but getting people to move is difficult. Understanding people is difficult. I mean, the door said it best. You know, people are strange. It, they're, they're, we are complicated uh, species, uh, but that's what makes us so fascinating. And those who are curious see the ambiguity, they see the messiness, the complexity of humanity. They go, oh man, give me more. I, 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 want, I want more of that. Uh, but unfortunately, we, our, our industry isn't, um, isn't well known for our, our curiosity. Um, and we aren't terribly well known uh, for, for our rigor in studying people. Even though that's the, the core of, of what we're, we're here to do business-wise, know, right? we're the voice of. So. Yeah. If I'm an entry level marketer and, and I'm doing my homework, I'm doing, I think a good job of it. I'm, I'm reading work from Byron Sharp and, and Peter Field and Les Binette, and I'm hearing things about sophisticated mass marketing versus a uh, hyper targeted approach that I learned maybe in school or breaking down or trying to understand the difference between uh, your long-term brand marketing and your, and your short-term sales activation marketing. And there's really, really cool frameworks and backed by great data and a lot of work, like, like you're saying, how do I fit culture yeah. into, into all of these frameworks yeah. and, um, some of the things that might, might trip you up from, from sticking to the core of what's important. Yeah. I mean, this is the part that, um, this is the part where I divert from Byron Sharp because I do believe in, uh, distinctiveness distinctive assets, that's very important so that you're able to cut through. I do believe in memory structures because memory structures uh, uh, create salience in people's minds, which is 
one of the things that make brands so so powerful, their identifiability. Uh, but there are a lot of brands that I know very well that have great memory structures in my mind and have amazing uh, distinctive assets. But I'm never going to buy them, ever, <laughs> ever, ever going to buy them. Why? Because they are incongruent with who I am. I know Marble. I know Joe Camel, right? I, I, I know all this iconography of, of smokers, but I don't smoke. And I will never smoke. And I've seen all the ads and I know, I know all the things. I know all the things. But smoking is incongruent with my identity and who I am. And I think th it's the, it is the binary nature of the notion of how brands grow uh, that makes it divorce from humanity. I mean, everything that we see, when we see a branded asset, we translate it through cultural lenses, right? Like for some, they see the, the brand sketchers, they go, fun. For others, like me, they go, lame, right? You never see me with a pair of sketchers on, right? It's just not, right? Because of what the brand means to me and people like me. So while distinctive assets are important, yes. While memory structures are important, absolutely. Right? While you know, we want to build brand in the long term, but also activate in the short term to maximize uh, uh, profitability, right? With the long and short of it, absolutely. But all of these things are operating within the context of culture, all of it. So to not think about culture in these things it's like talking about a fish and not mentioning water in everything that we, that we do. And this, you know, you, you see cultural scholars, or you see Brian Sharp taking a lot of swings at cultural scholars, and I guess vice versa, uh, because he ignores all those things. You know, he, he, he ignores them, them all. And, I, and to ignore culture is to ignore humanity in the equation. I mean, that is, that is a losing proposition. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's one that's, that's hard to argue with. And something that's exciting for me, and, and I'm sure many others, where you have great work um, coming out of Ehrenberg Bass, you have great work coming out of the UK, you have incredible studies that are making it easier to navigate or more meaningfully navigate as a marketer within the world. You have these great tools that are um, at our disposal, but at times it feels like we forget to take each with a grain of salt and remember yeah. the core that we, we have to come, come back to and that being truly empathetic and not necessarily just like caring or wanting to research about fe uh, people, but truly align, um, a business, a business's purpose with, with those people. I mean, so that's that, how business is all about that. It's just about people. That's it. Like all the frameworks, they're nice to have. They're, they're good arrows to have in the quiver. Uh, but everything we use about people. So the framework you want to use is the framework that is the most human. And culture is the governing operating system of humanity. You want to understand people, you understand their culture. And the better you do that, the more likely you are to use the framework at your disposal uh, in, in, in a successful way. So what are some ways to, to keep yourself straight within all of that clutter? Yeah. Uh, as far as like, as it being a marketer. Yeah. Or as oh. a person in general. Oh yeah. I mean, how it all works. Curiosity. I mean, mm -hmm. and this is, you know, when I was at Wyden, even before Wyden, you know, the people I've hired, you know, shout out to anyone that I've hired, I've hired quite a few people, <laughs> uh, <laughs> The thing that, that gets me most excited about anyone is curiosity. Like, you know, we're hiring someone, especially, uh, a new, a new entrant into the, into the, 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 the field into a, uh, you know, entry level, just starting off freshly minted new, uh, advertiser and you don't have very much experience. You ain't done nothing. You know, you may have a book, but you never put anything in the world. Right. So you never done anything. Um. And you know, we look at the school you went to and the things you've done and how you taught as a signal of potential. That's what we're buying, right? We're buying your potential. 
I like this person or, you know, they seem to be personable and they seem to be energetic. They seem to be these things, these intangible things that we marry with the tangible things we have, like your resume, your, 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 your book, if you're creative or your writing. Um, and we use that to make a judgment call. Is this person good? And will that person be good here? Um, the thing that I look for always is just curiosity because when it comes to potential, curiosity is the best signal of what you're likely to do. Because if someone's curious, they're going to go, wow, that's cool. I don't even know what this is. Let me go read on it. Let me go play with it. Let me go touch it. And I'm doing it not because I'm getting paid to do it. I'm doing it on my off hours because it excites me, because I'm genuinely interested in this thing. Right? It's not a transactional relationship. I am, I am uh, I'm being motivated intrinsically. And those people, like those people, whatever they don't learn, whatever they don't know, they're going to go learn it. Whatever skill they don't have, they're going to go practice it without anyone telling them to do it. Right? That level of curiosity, it's just, I mean, it's invaluable. Furthermore, even as a professor at the University of Michigan, I have some of the brightest students in the world, but I can't teach them to be curious. They can be smart. They can be savvy. They can be clever. But curiosity, I can't teach. And as soon as I see it, I go, oh, you, come here. And then those who are, are curious, you know, you point them to the place to channel their curiosity, particularly to observe behavior, to, to watch people like a comedian does. Watch them. You get a sense of, okay, they're doing this and this, they're doing this systematically. So what's happening here? So you're essentially applying, you're applying theory to a phenomenon. And ergo, applying that theory to the phenomenon, you're describing what you're seeing. And then you find a way to tell all the truth, but tell it slant, like Emily Dickens put, says it. You tell it slant and people go, oh my goodness, I totally do that as the <laughs> stage. And the best advertisers do that. They don't create ads. They create cultural production, cultural product. And that cultural product is so intimate with those people that when a brand says it, they go, who told you about that? How, how do you know about that? You know we do that. Okay, you're one of us. Um, but you only get there through curiosity. Yeah, that's... Oh, it's a breath of fresh air to hear when you when you say it that way. Because I had I had one of those moments recently um, with one of my coworkers. Or they're like, "Why why do you do this? Why do you get on the why do you get on a podcast and talk to people about advertising and marketing?" And I was like, "Well, cause it's an awesome way for me to know more, and I can also like share the hints with with everyone else." But um, I asked her, "I was like, well, why are you here? Like, why like why?" Why do you love this or, or claim to love it? And she's like, I had a professor back at school who sent me with a clipboard and questions to go stand in a grocery style, a grocery store aisle and talk to people who were buying eggs. And I was like, holy shit. Mm. I had a professor at school, but I was in the peanut butter aisle and I had <laughs> never had more fun in my entire life just yeah. getting to learn about peanut butter. Yeah. And for her eggs, wild, like, like not things that are, you know, the most exciting. We're not talking about Apple and, and Nike here, but, um, those moments within the like cultural tribe of the advertising marketing world are, are always really fun. I mean, those are the vibes, man. I mean, I think of some of the, the, the most fond memories that I have or case studies that I'm most proud of. They're for things that aren't sexy, you know, ego waffles. Uh, a State Farm insurance, right? Doing Cliff Paul for State Farm, right? Like, man, some of the best work that I've done for a brand that, like, you know, no one wakes up in the morning and go, I'm so excited about insurance. Yes. <laughs> that the category people, you know, dream about on on their on their CV or on their in their in their book. But yet, you know, you find yourself with the client despite the category despite the industry that are just as curious as you are. And you go, oh man, like let's nerd out on this. And it's through that, uh, that interrogation that you get to some really interesting things and you go, oh, we got to make this. I mean, and that's like, when you hear a client say that, like, oh, we got to do this. You go, yes, <laughs> this is it. Like this, this is it. 
And those are the vibes, man. Th- th- those are the vibes. You you describing that it makes me think of a, another industry that is one I've spent a ton of my time in my early early career um, that's been neglected um, for thinking about culture and being market oriented and, and human oriented, and that's the B two B world, one mm-hmm. where folks have completely forgotten that a B two B partnership says just as much, if not more, about you than. Yeah the CU Boulder hat that I'm wearing on my head. I mean, B2B is so ripe for disruption. It's unbelievable. I mean, like, suddenly they get like a little hint of something interesting, man. They just clamor over it, right? I remember so vividly, this is about, oh, wow, I'm, I feel like old, I'm going to say this right now, but 10 years ago, shoot, it was like 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. No, sorry, maybe nine years ago. Um, this American Life released so our podcast, um, uh, serial, serial podcast. And the advertiser was MailChimp. And the ad was a woman pronouncing MailChimp incorrectly. It's like MailChimp. And now MailChimp, it's not a B2C provider. It's a B2B flight, right? The, the other B. This happens to be typically small businesses, right? Uh, the big businesses too, but small businesses in particular with those, those podcasts were aimed for. Um, and they used that as a campaign, mail script, mail clip, right? Entire campaign built on the mispronunciation in this, uh, this podcast uh, advertising because people were talking about it. It was a part of the discourse, it was part of the language of a group of people. And MailChimp said, oh, let's borrow that language. Let's participate in the discourse uh, surrounding this, 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 this mispronunciation and use it as a way to insert the brand into the discourse, which it already naturally had license to. I mean, I mean this, they, they won awards, it was like celebrated like crazy. And it's a small thing that they found a way, a way to, to, to tell it slant, tell the truth slant. I mean, marketers, good night. Like to be a BB marketer, it's just, it's just open white space for you to go to, to, to really explore. Yeah. It's, it's one that's, that's definitely exciting. And one there that's, uh, easy to educate too, because you have yeah. all, all this work yours now being uh, a major part of it. One that I've already ripped too many pages out to to teach in our, in our weekly class for my team. And one that for any entry level aspiring advertiser, uh, the, the B2B world is one that maybe you should look at a little bit closer. That's right. I mean, cause look, B2B, B2C, it's all P2P. It's all people. That's it. It's all people. I mean, it all, that's what it all boils down to all the science, all the rubrics, all the, 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 all the, the frameworks, they all boil down to people. And the better you understand them, the better you'll be able to activate them. And what's the best way uh, to activate people? It's through culture. It's the most powerful external force of human behavior. We'll stop. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to reel us out of the, the B2B world and, the, and do kind of the, the mass market, every, everyone, because this is super timely. And speaking of people that I don't understand, Elon Musk has made a huge change today. One that has kind of shaken, I mean, it's kind of been happening. You had all the, the anticipatory um, tremors of an earthquake coming in. Today was the earthquake for, yeah. for, for Twitter and that Twitter brand. Is this one, this change, one that feels like it's being made with an understanding of a new tribe or a new people or a larger group of people, or is this, this, uh, the smallest example of a test and learn where it's like, fuck it, let's change it and see what happens. Uh, I think that the, the naming convention of the new company is apropos to what he's doing. It's an X variable. Who knows? Right? It's unknown. Um, I don't 
I, I hesitate to call it a rebranding, uh, more so just a renaming with new iconography. Because what are brands? They're identifiable uh, signifiers that conjure up thoughts and feelings in the minds or hearts of people relative to a company, organization, institution, organization, uh, uh, entity, or person. Right? Um, and though we change the name, he has changed the name, Twitter to X, we still have the same, still signifies the same thing. It still means the same thing to us. Just like when uh, Facebook changed the name to Meta, we were like, oh, you're still Facebook though, fam. Like, <laughs> still Facebook, you know, even JC Penney's changed the name to, to JCP. It's like, no, still JC Penney's. Radio Shack to the Shack. No, still the Shack. I mean, even uh, Puff Daddy changed his name to Diddy and then P. Diddy and then Brother Love. It's like, yeah, still Puff Daddy, right? Unless there are material changes in how the brand shows up uh, to help signal through Azajan Shaksa's system new meaning that we associate to it, it's painting. Uh, lipstick on a, on a pig, man. So the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see if they do change how how X will will show up. Yeah, and and for who. So uh, my my last question. You have written your your first book, and had a lot of success in the advertising world, a lot of success in the marketing world, and great experience in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Um, what are the three things that you wish you knew when you were an entry level oh. advertiser or marketer? Um, I wish I knew that, uh, that the world is not, that the world does not reward on merit, that it's not about how smart you are how strong you are, how quick you are. Um, it's really about how much value you provide. Um, you know, uh, with the, the, the scripture said, the race isn't given to the swift or the strong, but the one who endures to the end, All right? And it's really like, you know, you gotta put in the work. You know, there is no elevator, there's all stairs. And there are people who will get looks that would get, you know, acknowledgement that aren't as talented as you. And you go, why is this happening? Like, what's going on? You know, and, and it really bugged me out for a long time, you know, um, but I realized it's the way people valued them versus valued me. They saw the hard work that I did, but they valued that person more than me. Because like, it's the second thing I wish someone told me, or I wish I would have known. Um, I mean, go where you're valued. <laughs> you know, I tell my daughter this all the time. My eldest daughter, Georgia, you know, I tell her that a water bottle, I mean, a bottle of water costs about a dollar at the gas station, give or take 50 cents or so. Costs $3 at the movie theater, $5 at the amusement park, $6 at a football game. Same bottle of water, right? Two hydrogens and oxygen, same brand, same bottle of water. But people value it differently depending on the context. So go in the places in the environment where people value you. And the last uh, was advice that I got later in my career by a gentleman named Steve Stout, who started and runs an agency called Translation, where I worked for four years. Uh, and he says, if you have an idea and it's logical and it's well thought through and no one else gets it, then you're probably on to something. And that's the truth, man. Like the things that, I'm, that I've written in the book, many of those things I've been preaching for a decade, a strong decade. And people looked at me like I was crazy. People said, oh, that sounds good. But they never applied it. Never, you know? Uh, and I was like, man, maybe, maybe I'm bugging. Like maybe something wrong with me. Like no one else sees it. Maybe I'm crazy, you know? But I'd hearken back to Stout's words. If it makes sense and no one else sees it, that you might be on to something. And uh, I'd venture to say that I think I'm on to something. I would venture to say the same. It is a great read and, and definitely shifted the way that I view the work that I do every day. And uh, even if you are just the, the marketer with a book in your hand, it's still a great book to have in your hand at the beginning. I appreciate that, brother. Thanks so much.
Right on. Marcus, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. I, I appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. I hope it's helpful.